1 Corinthians chapter 3. Glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Reading from verse 6. Paul said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planted and he that watereth are, are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. The New King James says, Ye are God's field. I'm going to choose the New King James and I'm going to say, You are God's field. Say, I am God's field. According to the grace of God which is given unto me. <laughs> you are God's field according to the grace of God. Which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation and another builder thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Let him take heed how he build it. I'm titling the message today, You Are God's Field. And I'm going to subtitle it, The Fear of the Lord. Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Every man. Who does every man include? Is it just the apostles, Apollos, Peter, James, John, Paul? Or does every man include you and me? But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon, on that foundation which is Christ. And there's a spirit of the fear of the Lord just in that very phrase. Be careful how he builds thereon. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So we're talking about the fact that you are God's field. But in today's message, a particular emphasis on the fear of the Lord. Amen? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Say, I like this already. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Let's pick it up in verse 14. It says, For the love of Christ constrains us, compels us, motivates us, dominates us, directs us. The love of Christ that has been shed abroad in our heart. God who is love that is on the inside of you. The love of Christ constrains us because we judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all so that they which live, that's you and I, should not henceforth live on to themselves. Who then should they live on to, if not themselves? On to him which died for them and rose again. They should not live on to themselves. In other words, every breath they take should, should be for him, should live on to him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, that being the case, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. 
from here on, we have a, a brand new perspective and outlook. We see everything and everyone differently. Though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now, henceforth know we him no more. We don't see him merely as a man walking the shores of Galilee, but we see him for who he is. And as he is unveiled, and as we come to a comprehension of him, the word of God says there's a grace that comes at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As he is unveiled and as he appears, so we begin to see who we are. For when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone that has this hope and expectation purifies himself even as he is pure. So from henceforth, we, don't, we have a totally different perspective. Though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He's a new species altogether. All things are past. All things are passed away. Behold, look, check this out. All things are become new. And all things are of God. Say all things are of God. Who had reconciled us unto himself. Unto who? Himself by Jesus Christ. And had given unto us this ministry of reconciliation. He has reconciled us unto himself. And he has made us a part of that very same ministry of bringing everything and reconciling everything unto him. To wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. It is as if God gave his son Jesus as a seed. The Bible says, in Genesis 8 and verse 22, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest will not cease. As long as there is winter and summer, there is winter, is there not? <laughs> as long as there is heat and cold, seed time and harvest will not cease. So God sowed his son as a seed. The Bible says in John chapter 12 and verse 24, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. It remains a single seed. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. There is a supernatural multiplication that takes place. So God gave his son as a seed, and in exchange, he got you and I. In exchange, here came the church. The seed has reproduced itself. That's the work of reconciliation that Jesus has done. But now it goes further. And you and I, we are the church. And through us, there's a reconciliation. So we are a seed to be reproduced so that God can get a hold and reach the world. God so loved the world that he gave it his only begotten son. So as is verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and had committed unto you and I this word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. He was made to be sin for you and I, that you and I could come into this oneness with God, that you and I could be joined to the Lord and be one spirit with him, so that you and I could be free from guilt and shame and insecurity and inferiority, so that you and I can operate in the very authority of heaven, in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the authority of God, so that you and I might have, might have rights and privileges as the very sons of God. We then, as workers, together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Let us take heed how we build. 
Let us not receive the grace of God in, in vain, but let us appropriate the, gra the grace of God and let us do so carefully and let us do so accurately by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen? Now, I want us to, to get a hold of this particular point at, at the outset. You and I belong to God. Ye are of God. You have been bought with a price. You belong to God. I don't want to treat us as property to say you are God's property, but you belong to God. Say, I belong to God. And that's good. Ye are of God. The reality is it's no longer you that live, but it is now Christ that liveth in you. Galatians 2.20. And the life you now live, you live by the faith of the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. As Jesus is, so are you in this world. You belong to God. Now, how is Jesus? How was Jesus? How did Jesus walk? How is he now? The Bible says in John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus says, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So the will of God, he says, my meat is to do the will of God. The meat is the doing of the will of God. That's the meat. Amen? That it might be what? Meat in my house. That's another good message. There needs to be meat in the house. The will of God needs to be done in the house. But we are his house. So it is the will of God that must be done in us and through us. First Corinthians chapter 6, without turning to it. Verse 17 says, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Ye are not your own, it goes on to say, for you have been bought with a price. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your mind. Revelation chapter 5. Let's just flip over there for a moment. You are now God's. You belong to God. Say, I belong to God. I am his completely, totally, every cell of my being, everything about me belong to him. Amen? And you are, by the way, <laughs> you are a stoat over his stuff. So if everything in you and about you belongs to him, that makes you a stoat over yourself to God. Think about that for a moment. Mm, interesting. Anyway, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For you were slain and you have redeemed us to God. You have been redeemed to God by, the, by his blood. Out of every kindred, out of every tongue, out of every people, out of every nation, which is to say, out of every human definition. In Christ, there is neither male nor female, born or free, black or white, Jew or Gentile. There aren't those, those things that separate us in the natural. Who has a PhD and who doesn't? Who is good looking like I am and those who are not? Those things do not exist. In him, right, you have been redeemed out of all of that human stuff and limitations. And you have been redeemed unto God. And, it's, and, and he has made us unto God, unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign in this earth. Now, the reigning in this earth is certainly not based on your kindred, on your town, on your language, on your people, on your nation, on your ethnicity. It is based on the fact that you are of God, you've been redeemed, and you are now a king and a priest unto God. When you function in the capacity of who you are, who you really are, and whose you are, that's when you reign. Are you with me? Hallelujah. And in fact, if we were to parallel that with Romans chapter 5, verse 17, which says that when you receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, you are able to reign in this life by Christ Jesus. You are able to reign in this life because of what Jesus has done. You are able to reign in this life because of the sacrifice of Christ. When you receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness by virtue of the sacrifice of Christ, you reign. 
Which means then that if you put this all together mathematically, it would mean that once you, once you position yourself as who you really are, a king and priest, redeemed unto God, you will automatically be in that place where you're going to be able to receive the abundance of grace and the gift of this righteousness and reign. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let him take heed how he build on this foundation, which is Christ. Redeemed unto God. Second Timothy, don't turn to it. Second Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 7 through to 10. Basically says that God is, here you are in this new person that you are. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but you have a spirit of love, a spirit of power, and you have a sound mind. That being the case, don't be timid. That being the case, from here on, do not be ashamed of the, of the testimony of God. Do not draw back from the testimony of God, of what God says about himself. But know this, and don't be ashamed of, of, of what persecutions and whatever you see might be happening on account of his name. Be a good soldier. Be strong. Do not be discouraged. Do not be dismayed. Operate in that spirit of love and power and a sound mind. And know that he has called you with a holy calling. And he has given unto you a salvation that is full of deliverance and, and wholeness and prosperity and everything else. And it was not according to your works. It was not according to the town and the kindred and the nations and your, and, and your works or anything like that. But it was according to his own purpose and grace which was given you in Christ before the world began. But it comes into manifestation as the reality of Christ in you begins to be unveiled. And as he is unveiled, what happens? All of a sudden, life and immortality and the excellency of God and what he has called you to and the glory of God, these things begin to come into manifestation. For Christ in you, unveiled, is the hope of glory and excellence. But none of this is according to your works. None of this is according to your own, for your own doing. It is according to the fact that, of, to, according to what he has chosen. Because you are redeemed and it's because of who you are and whose you are. Are you with me? Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Say, I belong to God. I am his, and he is mine. Or right, Ephesians chapter 1. Glory to God. Let's pick it up in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places, in that realm of God. In that place where God reigns. According as he had chosen us in him. From the foundation. From before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy. Say holy. And without blame before him in love. Having predestined us. Unto the adoption of children. By Jesus Christ. To himself. Say to himself. Say, I belong to God. According to the good pleasure of his will. That's meat. Doing his will is meat. Hello? You know, the Bible says um, in, in, in um, Hebrews 5 and verse 13. It says, strong meat belongs to them who by reason of use. Okay, I'm not get, quoting that correctly. Let me correct that. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 13 says, Everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness because he's a babe. But strong meat belongs to them who by reason of use. Them that are full age. Those who by reason of use have, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, those that use milk are unskillful in this word of righteousness. They are unskillful in operating in this oneness. 
But those that are, that are skillful in operating in this oneness are called meat eaters. But then Jesus said, doing the will of God is what meat is. This is my meat to do the will of God. Amen? So then your maturity would be somewhat measure, measured by, are you doing the will of God? Is it the will of God that is being done? Good thought. All right, let's back, back to Ephesians. Having predestined us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, that you and God has done this so that you and I would be literally examples and, and, and we would be living epistles and demonstrations of how gracious he has been. And also, too, that our very lives will be a reflection that will bring praise to his grace and to his glory. Are you with me? His life will be so manifested that people are going to say, oh, ah, dear God is a wonderful God. He is awesome. Look what he has done. Look what he has done in them. Look what he's doing through them. Look what he's done for them, that you and I might be to the praise of his glory. So it's all about him. I belong to him. I am his. And he is mine. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In verse 12, it goes on to say that we should be to the praise of, the, of, his, of his glory. Those who first trusted in Christ. And then it drops down to verse 17. Paul prays that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. In the knowledge of who? Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you might know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. He has got stuff inside of you that belong to him, that is his inheritance. And you are his inheritance. Say, I'm God's inheritance. It will go on to say in Ephesians 2 verse 10 that you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And there are things that you are supposed to walk in that he has ordained for you to walk in. You are his workmanship. You are his inheritance. And I want, this is what I'm, I'm trying to state emphatically. You belong to God. You are God's inheritance. You, it's, as, it's like you are God's reward. And you are God's benefit. You are what God got out of this redemption deal. Come on, man. God gives up his son. Don't you think God is a good businessman? I mean, God gave the very best he had, his son. And that price that Jesus paid was an overpayment. It, is, it was greater than the penalty of sin. It was greater than the curse. It was greater than what the devil had done to Adam. And God made an overpayment when he, when, when he gave his son. Do you believe God did that and not, didn't expect anything in return? You are his return. You are his reward. You have become his inheritance. You belong to him. Are you with me? Hallelujah. So, 1 Peter chapter 1, let's just let the word do the talking, amen? Blessed be the name of the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 4, sorry. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. All right. Verse 1, for as much then as Christ had suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with this same mind. Now, why do you need to arm yourself? Is there a war on or something? Amen. Arm yourself with the same mind. For he that had suffered in the flesh had ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to what? The will of God. Say, so that's meat. All right. <laughs> All right. We could, we could, let, me, let me skip the other verses. The whole thing is that we are to live for the will of God. You belong to God, and you are now here for God's purpose and for God's will. You are not your own. In fact, you've been crucified. It's not even you here anymore. 
It is Christ that liveth in you. Hello? Say I'm getting this. All right. Now, God says in Malachi chapter 3 verse 17, and hear this. God says, they shall be mine when I make up my jewels. Well, praise God. God calls you his jewel. Say, I'm his jewel. Isaiah 43, verse 21, God says that, his, that this people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. And in verse 25, he says, I've blotted out your transgression. For my own sake, I've removed it so it's not in the way. So it's not separating us. So that I can embrace you. I who am a consuming fire, that I could so transform you into my image, into the kind of fabric whereby I could come and live on the inside of you and you don't become burned up. So that I can have intimacy with you. I have blotted out and removed your transgressions for my own sake. Because I formed you for myself and I want us to be in this oneness and I will not remember your sins anymore. Now the next verse says, Put me in remembrance. Now, are you supposed to put God in remembrance concerning your sins when he said he don't want to remember it anymore? No, he says, put me in remembrance of what I have said, of the things that I've spoken, of the power and authority of my covenant. Come, plead your case before me. Let us reason together. What is the point? You belong to God, and you are here for the will and the purpose of God. Now, there is an enemy, is there not? And he hates God. And he can't exactly get to God. He was kicked out of heaven. Are you with me? But guess what? You are the closest thing that he can get to. So he's after you. He hates you because he hates God. He want to destroy you. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Amen? The Bible says he goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Indicating that it's not everyone he can devour. But we got to learn to be in that place where we can operate within the, with the whole arm of God and function in such a manner that we are not as vulnerable. Amen? So the devil hates you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to put... I mean, your body is supposed to be the temple of God and supposed to bring God supposed to be glorified in your body. What does the devil do to try to offset that? He wants you to be saturated. He wants to fill you with sickness and disease so as to destroy God's temple. He wants Jesus' righteousness is being made unto you righteousness so that you could be free from condemnation and insecurity. He wants to load you up with, 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 with condemnation and bring to your remembrance everything that you've ever done wrong. But we've overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. But that's his job. That's part of his destruction. He wants to, he wants you, uh, he, he wants to, I mean, he will bring people against you. He will work through others. What for? So as to cause you hardship, so as to derail your purpose, so as to, 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 to stop you from being that epistle. He will use family. He will use friends. He will use people in the workplace. He will use the media. He will use the world. Anything. Stop them. Stop them. Stop them. Steal. Kill. Destroy. He wants to, I mean, he, he wants us to be seeded with wrong, with, with, with error. Believing that poverty is godliness. He wants us to be poor and have lack and to be confused and to be oppressed and have no joy and have no peace. That's his assignment. Amen? But the Bible says that we are to be the epistles of Christ. He wants to demonize you. He wants to consume you with his own lust, with his own evil passions. He wants to possess you if he can. Sounds bad, doesn't it? He wants us to be selfish. He don't want us to flow and function in the nature of God and in the love of God and in righteousness and in truth and in the purposes of God. All right. I, I, I'm saying this so that we can understand the seriousness of it, understand who we are, whose we are, and take heed how to build in that foundation. There is a comprehension that we, this comprehension that I'm, I, I'm trying to present 
is the fact that you are God and you and I must learn to function in that capacity. Function in this place where you belong to God. It's who you are, functioning in who you are, but also whose you are. Because the truth of the matter is, who you are is actually defined by whose you are. Think about that. If who you are now is, is so connected with whose you are, I know it's important to know I am so and so, I am this, but it's that's important, of course. But is it not just as important to know whose you are? I belong to God. Say, I belong to God. Now, when you and I learn to function in this place of who he has made us, of him being owner, of him being Lord, of him being possessor, of us being his, when we learn to function in this place, effectively what happens? The very covenant that we stand in, we are able to be more effective. We can stand and function in that covenant more effectively. We are able to walk in the authority of righteousness more effectively. Think about it. Righteousness is authority. The kingdom of God is activated by righteousness. It is the scepter of the kingdom. Hebrews 1 verse 8. In other words, the kingdom of God, with all of its power and all of its might, doesn't get into motion to do that is all that it's capable of doing without righteousness. Righteousness is what activates it, amen? And here, when we learn to function in this place, owned by God, we are his, and we yield ourselves to that, we become more effective in operating in that oneness. We become good stewards of what God possesses. Because in the final analysis, God owns the heaven and the earth and all them that are therein. But we are a joint heir. We are an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. You and I are covenant partners with God. We have stewardship of everything that belongs to him. Now, if we can get a hold of this truth and, and begin to have, if you were to put it this way, a co-owner's mindset. Amen? Where you, got this, you, you have this mind of Christ. That you own, that there is an ownership involved. That he, that when he gave you Jesus, he also freely gave you all things. You have this mind, the second Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace is multiplied to you through the knowledge of him and of Jesus the Lord. You have this mind, 1 Corinthians 3, 20, 21 and 23. All things are yours. You have this mindset, Luke 10, 19. He's given unto me all power. I have power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt me. We have this mindset, Ephesians 3 verse 10, that this was the very intent of God, that unto the principalities and powers, his manifold wisdom would be made manifest through the church. That's true, you and I. That's an ownership mindset that we got to get. Now how, I mean, you get this ownership mindset, and all of a sudden, the, the beggarly thing will be gone. The whining will be gone. The pleading, will, you know what is yours. You recognize that even though I might be a child and I have not yet matured and I'm not functioning in the will of God like I fully, like I should. We do have a verse, Galatians 4 verse 1, that even though he's a child and he's under tutors and governors and so on, nevertheless, he is Lord of all. Think about it. Say, I got to own his mindset. We can function in that more effectively when we yield to, this, to the reality of this place where we are, that I'm talking about. And I'm going to define it more clearly in a little while. But this place where you belong to God. I belong to God. Hallelujah. You become more skillful. Jesus says, behold, I've given you the keys of the kingdom so that you can open and close. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. We will become more skillful in operating those keys. All right? Are you interested? Do you want to live in this place? Function in this place? Function from this place? Where you are his. It's a good deal. That's what Jesus was talking about when he says, Seek first the kingdom of God 
and his righteousness come into this place that we're talking about, the place that he went to prepare for you. He says, come into this place, and all these things shall be what? Added unto you. Glory to God. What is this place that we're talking about? It is a place. The place is, is, is this is a place of sanctification, separated unto God. It is a place of consecration. It is a place of holiness. It is a place of the fear of the Lord. Amen? Now, sometimes, you know, when you go talk about the fear of the Lord, Sometimes it, many kind of feel as if it's some kind of bad word, as if you're talking legalism, and if it's going to be, it's about works and, and so on. But in fact, the fear of the Lord is an integral part of what we call grace, the grace message. The fear of the Lord is very central to it. Amen? And we got to get it. The Bible speaks, and, and, but it, 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 quite often in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, it isn't quite identified that way. And because we've had, we have had the spotlight and grace in the process, we haven't, get a light, we haven't gotten the microscope and all the other stuff out to look at it more closely. Because when we look at it closely, we will also find the fear of the Lord is an integral part of the grace of God and functioning in that grace. And if you take it out, you're going to have some misapplication where the grace is concerned. Amen? Ephesians 5, 21 says what? Submit yourself what? One to another in the fear of the Lord. Is that new covenant? Absolutely. Hebrews chapter 12. Matter of fact, let's, well, I'm just, hmm. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verse, verse um, 14. Pursue peace with all men and holiness. Holiness without which no man shall see God. Well, thank God, that doesn't mean without it, you're not going to get to heaven. You accept Jesus, you're going to make it to heaven. But it is saying that without holiness, no man will see God. It will hinder the manifestation. It will hinder the manifestation. If we fast forward to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, the end of chapter 6, talks, it was talking about not to be unequally yoked, etc., 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 and friendship with the world, and so on. And then it goes on, and then it goes on to say, God says, I want to be a God to you. I want to be a father to you. As your father, I want to show myself strong, and I want to demonstrate my godness in your life. Isn't that good? Can you imagine your father is God, and he's going to demonstrate it? Hey, but then it goes on to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, having therefore these promises for God to be God in your life, let us cleanse ourselves from every filthiness of the flesh and perfect holiness. How? In the fear of the Lord. Are you with me? Is that new covenant? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. It was first of all talking about the children of Israel. God had spoken. God says, I've given you the land. I've given you the inheritance. It belongs to you. Go up at once and take it. They say, no, no, no. I, I, yes, they, they, they're nice big grapes and so on and so forth. But no, 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 no. We don't believe God. And they didn't mix what God said with faith. And as a result, what happened? Even though a promise was left them, even though that inheritance was theirs, just like the inheritance is ours, they did not possess it and they died in the wilderness because they didn't mix what God said with faith. And it goes on to say in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 1, Let us therefore have fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into that rest and into the reality of the finished work of Christ, you and I should come short because of unbelief. Let us have fear. What do you mean let us have fear? Let us not be, let us learn from what happened with the children of Israel and let us have reverence for God. Let us stand in awe of his word. And if he said it, we know it's done. Let us, let us magnify the sacrifice of Christ that has purchased this for us. Let us have that reverence. Let us have that awe of God. Let God be true and every man a liar. So that what? A promise being left us. We might mix it with faith and have it manifested. Amen? Is that new covenant? Hallelujah. Now what about when the Bible would say things like in James chapter 4 and verse 3. You have not because you ask not, but then you ask and then you ask amiss. 
And then it goes on to say, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world, the embracing of the spirit of the world, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Isn't it, doesn't it say that? You cannot be a friend of the world and be a friend of God. So he says, come out from among them and be ye separate. You are not to have fellowship and a common union and sharing and that. Oh, yes, we need to communicate. Oh, yes, we need to preach the gospel. Oh, yes, we need to walk in love towards them and so on. But we are not of the same material. So it says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Present your body a living sacrifice. Does that sound like the fear of the Lord? Does that sound like holiness? Is that new covenant? Is that consistent with grace? Absolutely. Amen? So, let's, let, let's look at it a little further. Because the reality of it is, you know, some of we speak about grace as if it's a message. Grace is a person. Jesus himself is grace. That's why if anyone has a problem with a message of grace, they got a problem with Jesus. Amen? The Bible says the law was given by Moses, but grace, the law, was given. Here, take it. Read it. Do it if you can. <laughs> but grace and truth came with Jesus when he came, when the person came. Amen? It says in John chapter 1, verse 14, The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the glory of the Father. We beheld his glory full of grace and truth. He is the embodiment of grace. John 1, 16 of his fullness have we received grace on top of grace. He is the embodiment of grace. Hallelujah. Jesus' life and ministry is one of grace. Now understand this. Jesus is supposed to be our example, is it not? Right? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, to, be, to imitate Christ. Who offered himself as an offering, by the way? Hello? You want to imitate all of that? I think you should. How about offering up yourself as an offering? Present yourself a living sacrifice. How about offering yourself as a seed in the hand of God to be multiplied? Hello? He is our example. And he was the embodiment of grace. And he says, my meat is to do the will of God. Not my own will. I didn't come to do my own will. A body you've prepared for me, I've come to do thy will. He is our example. We belong to God. We are to do the will of God. We are to present ourselves to him. There is a connection between the fear of the Lord and grace. You see, what are we talking about sanctification or holiness? or obedience, consecration, all of those things are ultimately connected up to the fear of the Lord. It is, uh, they're all connected up. And what is the fear of the Lord? It is, having, it is having a correct response to who he is, his majesty, his excellence. It's standing in awe of him and his greatness and responding accordingly. That is not supposed to be lost. In the midst of the fact that you and I can come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find, and, and find grace to help in the time of need. That is not to be lost in the reality that through the blood we can enter into the holiest of holies. God is still God. Amen? He is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. So this fear of the Lord is an integral part of the message of grace that we preach. It is an integral part of this message of Christ and him crucified. Look at Jesus' life some more. Hebrews chapter four, 5, verse 7. Verse 7 says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, unto him that was able to save him from death, and he was heard... Because of his crying, because of his tears, because of his, his, his loud crying and tears? No, he was heard in that he feared because of his reverence for God. And though he was a son, yet learned the obedience 
by the things which we suffered. When Abraham obeyed God, the angel says, don't slay the boy. Now God knows that you fear him. The fear of the Lord is manifested in obedience. Part of the purpose of the gospel is to bring us to the obedience of the faith. Amen? Hebrews chapter 12. All I'm saying is, hey, the fear of the Lord is part, an integral part of this gospel of grace. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's pick it up, verse 28 and 29. Wherefore, we have received a kingdom. Do, have we received a kingdom? Are you in the kingdom? Is the kingdom in you? Absolutely. But we've received a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably. Remember, take heed how you build. That we might serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. The fact that it will say that we might serve God acceptably indicates that somehow we could serve God in a way that is not acceptable. Interesting, isn't it? Let us take heed how we build. Let us serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear because our God is a consuming fire. Now, when I think about it, I used to think when I hear God is a consuming fire, it's like, oh, I'm going to get burned up. <laughs> but I've come to recognize that God that is a consuming fire lives on the inside of me. There's a consuming fire on the inside of you. And all of this that we're talking about, all of this fear of the Lord and sanctification and holiness and consecration is really about you aligning yourself and being true to who you are on the inside. Amen? Letting that fire on the inside consume you. Letting that fire, let, let, let what's in your spirit work that out with fear and trembling. Work that out. Hallelujah. Amen? Titus chapter 2. There's a connection. Say grace and the fear of the Lord. Say it's all good. All right, Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation and deliverance and wholeness and healing and prosperity and total victory. How great is that grace? For the grace of God that bringeth all these things has appeared to all men. Now, it only comes upon those that believe, but it is available to all men. And what does it do? Teaching us. That grace teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. In other words, that grace teaches us the fear of the Lord. Is that what it says? The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Let's parenthesize, bringeth salvation and has appeared to all men. Let's parenthesize that and simply read. The grace of God teaches us that denying ungodliness and godly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. Of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Living in this place where you're constantly looking for that appearance. We're not talking about Jesus' second return. But where we are looking for the manifestation of that life and that nature on the inside of you becoming unveiled. Who had given, who had give, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. And purify unto himself a peculiar people. Does that sound like holiness? Does that sound like the fear of the Lord? Is that connected up with grace? Unto himself, a peculiar people that are zealous of good works. Not, not, not good works so that they could be holy. Not good works so that God might accept them. Good works of faith in corresponding to the reality of what God has done and who he is inside of you. Let me show you a verse of scripture. Uh, yeah, let me show you a verse of scripture. Flip over with me to first Psalms 130. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. First, where, where, where did I say? Psalms 130. Hallelujah. We don't want to go into the ditch on either side. Amen? We want to be balanced. But by being balanced doesn't mean that we want to compromise. It means we want to be accurate. We don't want to fall into some religious 
ditch rid of fear the Lord is concerned. But nor do we want to be in some other ditch that denies its application to our lives. Amen? And the new covenant in which we stand. Psalms 130 verse, verse mm, let's pick it up, let's, let's get verse 3. If thou, Lord, God who is a consuming fire that is so awesome, if you should mark iniquity, O Lord, who shall stand? Can you imagine if God has a ledger? <laughs> and I mean, every time you, you, you make a mistake, he <coughs> tick you off or, or put a line through it. I don't know which. <laughs> and he has this ledger and he's recording all of your iniquity. Who will be able to stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. There is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. This connects up the fear of the Lord with you standing in awe that all, oh, despite everything, he forgives me. I am forgiven. He deals with me as if I've never done anything wrong. There is an awe that comes from that. You know, the story is told about these, um, where it was Simon, whatever it is, that he invited Jesus to his house. And, and while Jesus was there, the woman came and she, uh, was it that one? And she washed her feet with her tears and, and everything else. And Simon thought, hey, Jesus, do you know who this woman is? I mean, this woman, you know, has got quite a reputation here. And Jesus turned to Simon and said, Simon, let me ask you something. First of all, uh, let me ask you something. Because Simon was a, I mean, he's a money man. He could relate to money. He says, imagine here you have somebody and they owe you $100. And you forgive it. But there's another person who owe you a million dollars. And you forgive it. Who do you think will be more graceful? Who do you think will love you more? Simon thought, well, of course, the one that I forgive a million dollars. So Jesus says, that's my point. You see, Simon, I came into your house, right? You didn't, I mean, you didn't give me the courtesy of washing my feet. You didn't even get, give me a glass of water or anything else. But look at this woman. This woman who has been, has, has been laden with sin, but now she's experienced forgiveness. This is how grateful she is. You, you're not as grateful. You know why? Because you don't feel, you, you probably didn't even feel you needed forgiveness to start with. But look at this woman. He who has been forgiven a lot, loves a lot. In other words, then, the depth of, of when you see the measure and the immensity of his forgiveness towards you, it doesn't make you want to go back and wallow in, in, in the pig pen. What does it make? It makes you want to love him. And it means more, you want to minister to him. You want to wash his feet. You want to please him. Are you with me? So what am I saying? There is a connection here, right? There's a connection. Let me just flip another verse of scripture. First Thessalonians chapter 3. Let's just look over that for a moment. Hallelujah. I want to stay on track here. We are staying on track, aren't we? <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse 10. Paul says, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. In other words, there must be some things in their faith needed to, be, to mature a little bit, right? Then to perfect that which is lacking in your faith. God, now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one towards another and towards all men. Even as you do towards you, even as we do towards you, abound in love towards all, to the end that he may establish your heart unblameable in holiness before God. That verse of scripture says that as you abound in love towards one another, what happens? Your heart becomes established in holiness. The whole issue of holiness. One time I got this revelation or comprehension of holiness, and when it is God and God only. There is none else, and it's just him, and it's just God only, and God only. Seek first the kingdom, God only. God. The more there is God only in your life, the more you are walking in that reality and in that comprehension and in that consciousness, the more you are coming into that holiness. Are you with me? Right? That's why the fruit of righteousness is what? Holiness. The fruit of operating in oneness, what comes out of it is holiness. Hello? So love is connected up to it. Where are we? Where are we? Glory to God. Okay, let's, let's just 
let, let's just throw a few things out here. All right. First John chapter 3, you don't need to turn to it. Read him from verse 1. It says, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet. Okay, no, no, no. Sorry, back up. It says, behold, what manner of love the Father has for us and for you, that we might be called the sons of God. The world don't recognize us, but they didn't recognize him either. So don't be, don't be shaken. But he says, but right now you are the sons of God. And even though it doesn't appear what you shall be when he appears, when he is unveiled, when you get a hold of and you can grasp him, when you can see him, we shall be like him. Because you are transformed and you are changed by the reality of who he is. We are changed from glory to glory as we behold him and his majesty and his excellence. Are you with me? Hallelujah. We don't have time to go to all these verses, but you can write it down first. Peter chapter 1, verse 1 to 3 speaks about sanctification and the sprinkling of the blood. It's new covenant. It is grace. 2 Timothy chapter 2, sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. Where we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. Brethren, beloved of God, because God from the beginning had chosen you to salvation. How? Through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. And belief of the truth. So it's not about legalism at all. It, might, it, it sounds like works, it sounds like legalism, but it's not. It's not. It is the obedience of faith. The Bible says in Romans chapter 16... Romans chapter 16. Remember Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the what? Gospel. And what are we supposed to do? Make disciples. Why? That they might obey all things. Isn't that right? Well, look at it. Look at the version, this version. Romans chapter 16. Reading from verse 25. Now to him that is, has the power to establish you according to my gospel. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the preaching of Jesus Christ. According to the revelation of the mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, which was kept secret since the world began, but now it is made manifest. That revelation is made clear by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandments of the everlasting God made known to all nations. What for? For the obedience of faith. Say the obedience of faith. You see, the thing about faith is that faith agrees with God. How can two walk together except they be agreed? Faith acknowledges the truth. Amen? Faith acknowledges the truth. Now, this whole process of the fear of the Lord and, and, and belonging to God, it is not works, but I'll tell you what it is. It is faith. It is the acknowledgement of the truth. It is the obedience of truth. The Bible says in Titus 1 verse 1 that the acknowledgement of the truth produces godliness. When you acknowledge the truth, then the manifestation of the God life comes forth. Amen? Philemon 6 says that the communication of your faith will work. It will produce when you acknowledge every good thing that is in you in Christ. What's in you? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, this new man has been created how? In righteousness and what? True holiness. God says acknowledge that. It is the acknowledging of it. And that's what the fear of the Lord does. It acknowledges the truth. Amen? It's not legalism. It acknowledges the truth. It acknowledges that I am holy on the inside. And, be, and then it begins to draw that out. Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 9, that the reason why certain fruits weren't operating in believers' lives is because they had forgotten that they were purged from their sins. In other words, then, they had forgotten and they had lost sight of the fact that this is who I am. I am washed, I am cleansed, I am sanctified, and in his presence, I am holy without blame, etc. And if you would hold on to that, that is what will produce the purity. It only tells you why the issue of talking right is important. The fear of the Lord is obedience. Jesus, even though he was a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. He learned obedience when he had to say no to the flesh. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8. And obedience is the natural response of your born again spirit. Choice is a response of the intellectual mind. 
the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But obedience is the tree of life. This is who you are. This is how you are. Amen? Psalms 112 verse 1 basically said, Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that holds God in high esteem. His delight is in the law of the Lord. He delights in God's word. The fear of the Lord esteems and magnifies the word of God. Psalms 119 verse 161 says, I stand in awe of his word. Isaiah 66 and verse 3 says, God says, it speaks about, the, about trembling before his word. The fear of the Lord will, will say what God say because it so honors the word of God. Psalms 34, reading from verse 9, read it right through. It says, I will teach you to fear the Lord. You want a long life? You want to see good days? Here is the key. Get a, uh, let me learn the fear of the Lord. And it says, I'll teach you to fear the Lord. And in verse 13, here is the first thing it says. Keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from speaking guile. Seek peace and pursue it. Keep your tongue. In other words, what did they say? The fear of the Lord is you got to learn to talk right. James put it differently. James says, if a man seems to be religious, but he doesn't bridle his tongue, his religion is vain. In other words, you say what God say. That's part of the fear of the Lord. Now, if you're going to say what God say, let me show you this for a moment. When you are, what does the Bible say? What is the weak supposed to say? The weak supposed to say he's strong. What if sickness and disease is in your body? What are you supposed to say? By his stripes I am healed. What if there is lack and, and insufficiency, the money's not in account. What are you supposed to say? My God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Isn't that how it works? So what if you're laden and you have some bondages and you have some addictions and you've got some sin? What should you say? I am the righteousness of God in Christ. You need to say, with all the bondage, smoke coming out of your nostrils, by, you need to declare, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. While you're in bondage and things are happening, I am the righteousness of God. While the devil is trying to beat your brains out, you declare, I have power and authority over him and over all of his works, and nothing shall by any means hurt me. So that's how the fear of the Lord talks. The fear of the Lord has a violence to it. Amen? Say violence and smile. All right. <laughs> now, this fear of the Lord, the Bible says, again, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, draw out your salvation. How? With fear and trembling. How do you get this life, this healing, this victory that is in your spirit? You draw it out with the fear of the Lord by talking right. By reverence in God. Let God be true and every man a liar. Deny the circumstances. Don't give the circumstances and those lying symptoms that make you want to forsake the mercy of God. Don't give them voice. Don't lend your authority to them. Speak the word. Amen? The word of faith is not even in thy mouth. That's the fear of the Lord. Hallelujah. To live. How do you live? Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ. It's not me here, but it's Christ that lived in me. How do you do that? And the Bible says, uh, uh, for, um, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but it's Christ that lived in me. And then it says, if righteousness came by the law, then Jesus died in vain. It described the fact that you're crucified, and it is now the life of Christ living in you. It described that as righteousness. Well, how do you do that? How do you... How does that be, be not just a scripture, but it moves and becomes your testimony? Romans chapter 6 verse 11 says, Reckon yourself to be dead indeed. Unto what? Fill in the blank. And alive unto God. Are you with me? That's how, but what is all of that reckoning? That's crucifixion. That's the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord told me the Psalms 25. Um, you got to fasten your seat belts now. We're coming in for landing. And this, uh, this airplane doesn't slow down when it lands. <laughs> so you better fasten your seatbelt. All right? <laughs> okay? Glory to God. All right. Hallelujah. Psalms 25, verse 12. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. In other words, the fear of the Lord... Puts you in a position 
to get revelation knowledge. God says it's the meek that I will teach my way. When you've got an attitude and your opinion is so much, you exalt your opinion, you're not going to get revelation. Amen? When you've got to wait until everything makes sense, you're not going to get revelation. Through faith we understand. When you say let God be, you've got to position yourself. The fear of the Lord will position you for revelation. The Bible says in um, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Amen? It goes on to say here in verse 14, Psalms 25, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. And, and there's a, the, another version says that that intimate fellowship with God is reserved for them that fear him. You could be born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, know a lot of praise and worship songs, but however, you have an attitude towards God. Every time you hear God say something, I don't believe that. Right? Yeah, but this is my opinion. Well, I'm sorry, dear. The word of God says, God says, man, you, do you want to hang out and be intimate and close with somebody that keeps calling you a liar? No. So intimate fellowship is reserved for the one that will honor and magnify and stand in awe of him and tremble at his word. So the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. And to them, he will show or reveal or unveil his covenant. Well, you've got a covenant with great and precious promises. Where God says, I got your back. I'm going to show myself strong on your behalf. Well, God, that's, that verse says that it is as you learn to operate in the fear of the Lord that you'll be effective in functioning in the covenant. Do you want to be effective in the covenant? There's a lot of people whose lives depend on you functioning effectively in the covenant because they don't know how to. Are you with me? Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory to God. It is the key to the manifestation of promises. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1. Having these promises, let us cleanse ourselves and perfect holiness with the fear of the Lord. The Lordship of Jesus Christ. You cannot declare Jesus is Lord. It says in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 6, and I paraphrase. If I be your Lord, where is my fear? If I am your Lord, where is my fear? Where is the reverence for me? Amen. In other words, God says, in other words, you took to be underneath his lordship and his government. It takes the fear of the Lord. Now, let me ask you something. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Well, does liberty sound like something you'd want in the grace part of things? Well, what is the key? The fear of the Lord. Amen? The fear of the Lord, Isaiah 33 and verse 6, you can look it up, but it says, um, Isaiah 33 and Verse 6 says, And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of your times, and the strength of salvation is the fear of the Lord. In other words, here is God. God's got wisdom. God's got knowledge. God's got judgment. God's got strength. God's got salvation. But then God says, Of all of these things that I got, the fear of the Lord, that's my treasure. That's my, hey, that, is, that is the one that I treasure the most. And you know why? Other versions will indicate because this fear of the Lord is the key to the rest of the stuff. It is the key to the wisdom, key to the knowledge, key to the judgment, key to the strength, key to the salvation. Do you want that key? Amen. Now the truth of the matter is you got that key because that key is in Christ. The spirit of the Lord was upon him. The spirit of wisdom comes from my knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And that's the same thing that was in the vine is in the branch. It's in you. But you just got to stir it up. You just got to awake to it. But without the knowledge of it, you're not going to awake to it. Amen? That's why I'm here. So the fear of the Lord is God's treasure, and it is the master key to God's treasures. The Bible also... Should I? All right. You see, we can talk about, I, I, there are scriptures, of several scriptures, particularly in the Psalms and in the Proverbs, that says, they that seek me early shall what? Find me, glory to God, right? You know, a farmer wakes up early to sow his seeds, and we're going to be talking about that soon. So it's good to see God early. But then it also says in, in, um, in Proverbs chapter 4, 23 to 29, God says, because you, didn't, you disregarded my word, you have no respect for my word and what I have to say. You, when you're in trouble and you start rising up early and you start calling on to me because you disregarded my word, God says, 
it's not going to happen because you didn't have any reverence for me. What am I saying? Even seeking God early will not work without the fear of the Lord. The praise of the Lord, praising God without reverence for him will not work. The Bible says your prayer could be like an abomination. Well, that's not the correct quote. But when you leave the word of God out of it. Amen? What am I saying? It is integral. It is integral. All the promises of God are where? In him. Yes and amen. Well, in him. To function in him, it takes the fear of the Lord. It's not apart from him that these things work. So, let me close this by saying this. I said all of that because we are heading to this. You are God's field. You belong to God. But because you are God's field, here is the situation. You are God's field and God wants his stuff in his field. God wants to plant his seeds, his good stuff. He wants you blessed. He wants you prosperous. He wants you healed. He wants you whole. He wants you to have joy. He wants you to have peace. He wants your life to bring forth fruits of righteousness. Fruits that reflect him. Fruits that are the outward evidence of his, the inward reality of him in your life. And then he wants what he has placed in your life. He wants you to take it, give it away, and have it multiplied. Everything in your life, he wants you to plant it in the lives of others and have it multiplied. But you, there's an enemy. And, and, if, and, 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 and here you have this, you are God's field, but in the process of life, things happen. So we have bad attitudes. Jesus taught in the parable of the sower that we got thorns. And rocks and stuff that gets into that soil that can mess it up. Well, don't you think God wants that cleaned up? Don't you want to pull out those thorns? And then the enemy comes along and he sows tears. And all of a sudden this stuff begins to show up. And he thinks, wait a minute, God didn't plan that. Where is this coming from? An enemy has done it. In life, situations happen. Conflicts with people. People come and sometimes they, they think they mean well, but they dump garbage into your life. And you receive it. And they come into your life as seeds. And here the soil doesn't pick and choose. It only produces according to what is planted in it. And so here you are. Asleep. Because the enemy saw these tears. When did he saw them? When men were asleep. And this stuff gets sown in your life. And all of a sudden stuff begin to pop up. All of a sudden you're dry. All of a sudden you can't get joy. All of a sudden things are happening. And you don't know why. Because you're bringing up fruit that the father didn't plant. Well, we need to uproot those as well. You need to get rid of the tears. You need to get rid of the thorns. The fear of the Lord, applications from the fear of the Lord will cause you to break up the fallow ground of your heart. So that you don't have to sow among those thorns. So that that soil could be, be, could be good soil. Amen? And so that we can begin to bring forth the harvest that God has for us and that other people need to come out of your life. Amen? 